Welcome to WRC 19, the World Radio Communication Conference being held in Shama Sheikh in Egypt. And I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio by Mindel De La Torre, who is the Chief Regulatory and International Strategy Officer for Omnispace. Mindel, welcome to the studio. Well, thank you, Max. Happy to be here. Now, I'd like to start off by talking to you a little bit about Omnispace. Perhaps uh, you could tell us a little bit about what Omnispace is and, and what you're doing here and why this conference is important to you. Well, thank you. So Omnispace is a mid-Earth orbit satellite company, and we provide uh, MSS, mobile satellite service, around the world. We're a global service, and uh, we're putting up our second generation system. So we're very interested in a lot of the satellite issues here, but one in particular, which is issue 9.1.1, uh, deals with the particular band that we use. We use the S-band frequencies, and so that particular issue has been studied during the last cycle. And so we're very interested in that particular issue. We're also interested in the bringing into use issues and some of the other issues dealing with satellites as well. So for those uninitiated, what is the S-band and why is it important? To ah, you? the S-band. It's the 1980 to 2010 megahertz, and it's paired with the 2170 to 2200 band. So the important thing about that band is it's not like the K you and the KA band where you have some rain fade issues and you have other issues. In that particular band, it's like the C band where it actually you know, goes through foliage and other things and so the rain doesn't, doesn't destroy it. So it's actually very good for areas that are tropical in nature and other things. And, and our company also does the complementary ground component, which is a terrestrial aspect of that as well. So we sort of do the two, not just satellite, but also terrestrial. So trying to explain to people at home who might not be too technically minded in principle there's a spectrum is a, is, a, is a finite resource that everybody's fighting for is that right? right exactly and we're trying to figure out which lanes we can use our satellite needs to use particular lanes for going the you know communications from earth to, to the satellite and then back down and there's some issues with the terrestrial as to whether they're doing the same thing so that's what we're trying to work out here so if we were comparing it to a, a motorway a freeway for yes. example you couldn't just widen the lanes exactly exactly because the satellite is up and it's operating and you can't just say you're going to change the lanes they have to be operating in the same way so that's what we're looking for is some you know uh, we, we would like to coexist and to, to figure out a way to do that here Okay, and uh, in, in principle, what are the main challenges facing satellite operators at the moment? Well, I think actually it's a really good time to be a satellite operator because technology has changed things so much. You know, now we have smaller satellites. Um, the satellite that we operate right now is a very large satellite. It's the size of a, of a school bus of a, or a bus. But some of the ones that we're looking at to replace it are much smaller. So, it, and, but they're much more powerful. So the technology has changed so much. And because also the, another thing that's really important to us is the launch, um, you know, launching of satellites is now, it's much more competitive. And so you have, uh, as a satellite operator, you have a lot of different, um, you know, options. Now, the, as far as the, obviously one of the issues always is spectrum, and um, so that's why we're here. And then, you know, obviously the fact that it takes so long to, to plan your satellite system that by the time it goes up, you hope that, you know, that you'll still be able to use the frequencies and still be able to, to, to operate the system. So, do you, have you got any idea how many satellites are, uh, are orbiting the Earth at the moment? Oh, I think it's thousands. And, and there are going to be many more thousands. Yes, exactly. I was going to say, in terms of the, 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 the size of the satellites that are going up there, I mean, what, what are the, what's, what are the, uh, the measures being taken uh, to avoid big traffic jams? Well, I think almost all countries now require some kind of collision avoidance, and they also require some kind, you know, sort of orbital debris, and, all, you know, those kinds of things are all, I think, people are thinking about a lot more these days, especially as they put up the mega systems. A lot of, um, of your colleagues here have been talking about how satellites very much come into their own in emergency situations. Uh, do you, I mean, do you think that that's uh, the case, or is, is there much more, much more to it than that nowadays? Well, there's much more to it, but I do think that that's one of the issues that we have in the S-band. We're very able to, to deal with emergency situations in places where there's no communications, no other communications. And then in the cities where you might not use uh, you know, satellite, you can actually use those frequencies for terrestrial means. And so that's why it's, it, it's sort of a different hybrid kind of system that we're looking at. And in terms of affordability, uh, how are things changing in that way? That's a great question because um, we took over the assets of a, of a um, 
bankrupt company. And the reason was because they thought that they were actually going to be, provide something like cellular service. And that didn't work out quite so well. And so, but now we're looking at IoT and we're looking at you know millions and billions of devices. And so when we can do that through satellite, so you can do, we're working with a lot of mobile network operators that are putting in that system for terrestrial, but when they need it out in the country or out in the mountains or out in, you know, but they're, they would absolutely need satellite. So that's where I think that there's a game changer with the IoT, that inter, that's the Internet of Things for, for those of the, you know, and so it'll be the little small devices, and those will be much cheaper than having a, a, a larger device, and they'll, it'll be, you know, basically 24 hours that they'll be able to get the data and that kind of thing. Coming back to the conference here, the end the result of this conference, everybody will be going home somewhat happy because there will be a general a consensus that will be agreed for all the points that are, that are raised here. H how it, does that actually work in practice? Well, it depends on the, uh, on the agenda item, obviously. And I think that, um, you know, one of the, the issues that we have in the satellite industry, and I also think actually for the terrestrial um, industry, is the fact that the that the lead time for issues here at the ITU is so long because in order to be on a agenda for a WRC you have to have it you know it has to be approved at the previous one so you're talking about at least a four year cycle and then often it's an eight year cycle the way that technology moves so quickly now that is i think you know i think the ITU probably needs to be rethinking that a little bit and I think, I'm, I'm not sure, I actually started doing uh, WRCs in the 1990s, but um, before that I think they actually had sort of limited kinds of WRCs. So they might have been a, a space WRC, or in fact at that point it was a WARC. And we might want to think about doing that again, because having this many people take go away from their real jobs for a month is really different. And I think when, you know, if you think about the way that, that the ITU first started, there were monopolies everywhere. It wasn't a competitive market. Now we have a super competitive market and everybody, you know, to, to be away from your, from your real job for a month is, can be very difficult. And so sometimes, you know, you don't, you, your issue doesn't come up for that particular day. But so it, it's, I, think it's, I think it probably needs to be rethought a little bit, but how, how that happens, I'm not quite sure. Let's talk about study groups. How important is the work of study groups? I think it's very important, particularly for, this, for the satellite industry. Um, I think that all that, that work tends to happen here. Terrestrially, they have other, other options, but um, for satellite, it is here. And, and in fact, our issue was studied during the last period, and it was studied by two, by two study groups. So study group four um, in 4C, and then study group five in 5D. So it had a dual track. And that meant that it was even, you know, more closely studied. But unfortunately, we didn't come out with a result um, for the conference. So I think that, that that's actually been, um, you know, probably a, a negative from, for, for this particular agenda item because the work wasn't quite finished. Now, you, you mentioned that you first attended here in 1990. As far as I understand it, in 1990 and, and today, uh, there hasn't been a great rise of female participation here at the conference. I think from I, the first time that I ever came was at WARC 92, and in that one there were, I think, 50 U.S. delegates, which is not, there are quite a few more now, and there were only five women. And so now I think that the, that the participation of women in the U.S. delegation is different, and, the, and you see a lot more women participating. But I think we really do need to bring women into the, into the fold. We need to be promoting them to be taking leadership positions at the ITU, as well as in this. I think you start at the study group level, and then you get into the work level and into the, you know, the, the radio assembly level and that kind of thing. And I think it's very important that we start early and with an, women. And there's an initiative called the Network of Women, which has been... Uh, uh, been going here for, for uh, certainly certainly for a fair, fair few years now, which is, is, is specifically trying to do that, is that right? Yes, exactly. Um, a few of us decided that we wanted to get, to try to get more women into the, into the system, as we were just talking about, sort of feeding into it. So we started it about, uh, I think it was before WARC 15, and we started a mentorship program, just trying to get women who, had, who were experienced to actually have someone that they were 
you know, explaining the, the ropes and everything. So it's a mentor-mentee program, and it's grown from there. And I was just very surprised and really delighted the other day when we had, like, I think over, about 200 people that were at the, the, uh, the meeting. And I think that they have quite a few mentees and mentors. They always need more mentors. So, you know, for the women who, are, who have been doing this, it would be great if they could, they could participate. It doesn't take long. I'm having a very good time with my mentees, so it's very fun. So hopefully a, a brighter future for, uh, uh, for, for gender balance here at, so. uh, at the conference. Well, look, thank you so much for joining us in the studio, and, uh, and hopefully we'll catch up with you again soon before the next uh, the next one. <laughs> the next one. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's been a pleasure having you here. Okay, thank well, you. thank you very much. Thanks Mike. a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you.